Welcome to another lecture provided by the Ithaca class. This is a school and not a church, and neither are we affiliated to any religious organizations. This school is a non-profit um, religious and scientific research organization that is dedicated to to dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to his present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. And since that time, we have established branch schools throughout the United States and in various parts of the world. This Ithaca branch was established in 1979. And at this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the, Sarah, of the Ithaca branch, Dr. Robert White, and our host, Dr. Gregory Prestis. Now, in this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word of Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of the physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name, a minor investigation on your part. And a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce a sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a J in the English language until some 1,400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible rendering of the true and original name of the Father and the Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh, our Heavenly Father, is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because the cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh, flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions, and understood in divine revelation. Later on, the self same spirit manifested himself in the physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simply yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of his name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also at the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai, showed him the tabernacle pattern and vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout these three compartments making up the one tabernacle pattern. In the school, we also show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure 
and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. In this school, we had 10 primary constitutional aims or objectives, and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua Messiah without the distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watch for this peace and our slogan is speak the truth. I'd like to welcome everyone. And we'll just, uh, today's lecture will be dedicated with a prayer by uh, the Dean of Ithaca, Dr. Robert White. That'll be followed by a scripture reading, which is Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter. Our readers this, uh, this at this lecture <laughs> are gonna be um, Dr. Donald O'Connell and Dr. Kathy Hewells. Let's take a moment to bow our hearts and minds unto our Heavenly Father and ask him to put us in a meditative state that we might comprehend what he wants us to see in this lecture. We thank him for all the manifold blessings he's blessed us with both physically and spiritually. And we are grateful to be here again this morning. In Yahshua's name, let's all say, hallelujah. 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 Wally, you want to read that? Or do you want me to? Yeah. No, go ahead. Okay. Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter. I'll be reading from a King James Version, inserting the true names and title where necessary. Deuteronomy 10. At that time, Yahweh said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me in the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in my, mine hand. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which Yahweh spake unto you in the mount, out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And Yahweh gave them unto me. And I turned myself and came down from the mount and put the tables in the ark, which I had made. And there they be, as Yahweh commanded me. And the children of Israel took their journey from Beeroth of the children of Jaakan to Mosrah. There Aaron died, and there he was buried. And Eleazar his son ministered in the priest's office in his stead. From thence they journeyed unto Gogada, from, and from Gogada to Jotbath, a land of rivers and of waters. At that time, Yahweh separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, to stand before Yahweh to minister unto him and to bless him, to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore, Levi has no part nor inheritance with his brethren. Yahweh is his inheritance, according as Yahweh thy Elohim promised him. 
And I stayed in the mount according to the first time, 40 days and 40 nights. And Yahweh hearkened unto me at that time also, and Yahweh would not destroy thee. And Yahweh said unto me, Arise, take thy journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give unto them. And now, Israel, what does Yahweh thy Elohim require of thee? But to fear Yahweh thy Elohim, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve Yahweh thy Elohim with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of Yahweh and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is Yahweh thy Elohim's, the earth also with all therein there is. Only Yahweh has a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked, for Yahweh your Elohim is Elohim of Els and Master of Masters, a great Elohim, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and the widow, and love the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear Yahweh thy Elohim. Shall, him shall you serve, and to him shall thy cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise. He is thy Elohim that has done these things, these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, and now Yahweh thy Elohim has made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. That was Deuteronomy, the ninth chapter, or tenth chapter. Thank you, Dr. Heels. And thank you, Dr. White, for the prayer. And for our first speaker this evening, today, now, this lecture, I don't know what time to say, will be um, from Pennsylvania, Dr. Daryl Hughes. Oh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and to be back here, see everybody. It's mm -hmm. always a pleasure to be here. As I was listening and reading along with the scripture, it reminded me of the, the phenomenal changes that Yahshua has bestowed upon me through his gift, nothing that I've done. Uh, I was just thinking back to when I was in the church, in the seminary, and how I read the Bible. And uh, I, I was just appreciating how to be able to listen to a scripture uh, lesson like this and read through a whole chapter and have things make sense. <laughs> It just hit me. I'm sorry. I'm sort of teary-eyed right now. I, I remember trying to read things, and nothing made sense. Uh, everything was... It didn't make sense. You didn't read it. You wouldn't. That's why, you know, Christians try to read the Bible, and they, they get a few verses, and that sounds good, and then they skip verses, and then they find the next verse that sounds good to them, and they take what they want to take. And uh, I just, I, I, I'm not going to stay there, but it's just such a powerful thing to me. Um, uh, I don't know, you know, I love, <laughs> I just love, love hearing, hearing the book read because it's, there's everything in here. There's so much in here. Um, and it's such a beautiful thing. Um, now, with this scripture, we know that it's going uh, this is Moses, Moses being told to bring to hew the two tables of stone like an, unto the first and to come back up into the mount. Um, and the reason that happened is because he uh, broke the first set of stones. Um, when he was up there the first time getting them made, uh, he went up and uh, uh, one thing that hit me is, is understanding 
that nothing that Yahweh writes or says is insignificant. <laughs> Every single thing that he does, he does with a purpose. You know, everybody in the world is trying to figure out, you know, they, they look at it like, yeah, we made a plan and then man screwed it up. You know, he gave, put Adam and Eve in the garden. He gave them commandments and, and man screwed it up. And then Yahweh had to figure out a way to save them uh, and all of this other such stuff. And it's such a powerless, like a powerless God and a confusing God that they teach about. Um, and we come down here and we learn that when Moses went up into the mountain, he was given the commandments. Um, when he was first given the commandments, um, and then uh, the you had the whole issue in the uh, in the wilderness here, where they uh, they got impatient, they went down and they built the golden calf, and uh, and uh, he ended up Moses ended up coming down and throwing the stones down and breaking them. Um, we learned, and we wouldn't know any of this if it wasn't for Dr. Kinley's vision. Uh, it's, I'm, I just feel really humbled right now. I, I, I was thinking before class how we, we don't bring anything to this. We wouldn't know anything about any of these things if it wasn't for Yashua. We, we couldn't right. see any of it. We don't bring anything to this table. And I also, as I'm feeling humbled, I'm thinking I wouldn't even be able to be humble if it wasn't for Yahshua. We got nothing to bring to this. But anyways, when he shows us it, it's such a powerful thing because everything points to a purpose and it points to him. Every single little thing that he does points to his purpose. And uh, I remember hearing about uh, like how I learned about when he went up the first time and he got angry and he threw the tables down. Well, he showed him the creation. He had shown him this creation, the days of creation and this pattern the first time or second time. And and then uh, when he broke the stones, uh, he hadn't seen the fall yet. He hadn't gotten that yet. Um, and he's told to, to bring bring some stone up now this time to, to make a new, you know, to write it again. Um, but this time Moses has to bring up his own stones, bring up the stones himself, and how this represented the old and the new covenant, or, or the old heart and the new heart, I should say. Well, yeah, the old and new, new testament, or, or real new testament or covenant, see, between Yahweh and his people. And uh, uh, and the second time he's bringing up his own because it's showing forth the new covenant it's showing forth that new testament um and the scripture starts with that um and let's get one of those uh let's see let's get uh jeremiah let's uh uh 31 and 31 i guess we'll go with that one we can get that 31 31 Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, No, Yahweh, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh. So See, I they're going to... Sorry, go ahead and finish it. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. See, <laughs> um, he, and he talks about the, the new heart, see, this new heart you have. And that's another thing, see. He says, I'm going to write it in their hearts. And, the, and we, we had to come down here to learn that those covenants weren't written like, like a tombstone, but they're written in, in a, like a heart-shaped figure. Um, on, on, uh, that, that's how the wood was shaped, was like a heart showing an old heart and a new heart, say, 
in an old covenant and a new covenant. Now, in the Christian world, they would think that the old covenant didn't work, so Yahweh had to figure, God, they would say, had to figure out another way to save. See? But that's not accurate. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, it hints to that in the scripture. Um, there's a spot in the scripture lesson, let me see, where he talks about, let me see, what verse is that? The, the, the verse where he talks, he talks about, um, uh, he mentions the heart. What verse is that? Uh, it's right in the scripture. 1016. 1016. Read that, please. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart. The and foreskin. Be no of more your, stiff necked. Foreskin of your heart. See, they look at the old circumcision, but they don't get that the, the whole purpose of the old covenant was, well, not the whole purpose. One of the purposes of the old covenant is showing forth the new covenant, say. There is a circumcision, but it's a different kind of circumcision. It's a different kind of, of law. It's not a law where you have to try and obey it. It's a law that's written in you. It's your nature. Don't we call it the law of nature, see, which they don't know, mention it names, it's the so-called law of nature, but it's really spirit law, see, and that's what the Holy Spirit in us, it, it puts spirit law in us um, so that Yahshua, it's Yahshua's law in us and his nature in us, see? And and um, so there's no mistake there. And, and, and to come down here and understand that it was planned this way and it was purpose, purpose this way. I'm not going to get get it up on this, but, you know, when he gave the commandment, he said, when you break it, you know, <laughs> Basically, he he didn't say, if you break this law, then this is going to happen. <laughs> he knew they were going to break it, see? And he knew that they weren't going to be able to keep their covenant. Um, get me uh, Deuteronomy 6 and 24-ish. Give me that. Deuteronomy 6 and 25. Six twenty-five, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before Yahweh our Elohim, as He hath commanded us. See, it would be our righteousness, but it wasn't meant to be our rights. Righteousness, see. Uh, where's where's the verse? My mind's blank about uh, to show that the old covenant was to sh show us that sin exceedingly sinful. Sorry, Kath. You're muted, Kathy. Somebody get if somebody get that. Romans three nineteen through twenty one and Romans seven thirteen fourteen. Thank you. Romans three nineteen. Now we know that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. And that all the world may become guilty before Yahweh. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of Yahweh without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And I'll just go over to Romans 7. I'm here. Romans 7, 13. Was then that which is good death unto me? Yahweh forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. See, the whole purpose of this law, this current ordinances, one of the purposes, I'm, I'm saying that again, because Yahshua fulfills all of this. There's other, there's other parts of the purpose. It's really all showing salvation. If you look at you, his purpose is Yahshua. I remember visiting Dr. Carol Ember one time. <laughs> and, and we were picking, we were kidding around, but any, any question, if you asked, answered and said, Yahshua. Yahshua is the answer to it. <laughs> That's answered everything. It's all about the fact that this all was about salvation. 
from the very beginning. Um, when he came out of that cloud, he was there was a death to him. See, uh, and uh, so every the purpose of the law was to show us that that to prove to us who we were, to prove it uh, that we weren't good, and that we needed a sa savior. But going, ah, oh, man. Um, so anyways, uh, no accident in anything he says. Um, his, his goal is to, to, we're looking at a new covenant. Um, and, and we come with no recommendation except Yahshua that he called our name. We have no power over it, but everything that he does is for a purpose. And, it, and it, it's all planned out, and he knows exactly what it is and what uh, what uh, what's going to happen. And uh, anyways, I, I'm 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 a little bit sort of I think a little bit uh, emotional to pass with you right now because I'm just sort of I'm just reading that scripture. The whole scripture was just. I'm, I'm not going to stay up. I'm going to pass it on to somebody else. I, I'm just so thankful to be here. I'm so humbled and and I'm so thankful that that I didn't have to do anything. I, I don't know why people get hung up on having to do something. That's what I did my whole life was try to do something. That was the whole purpose of the law and the old covenant was to show us that we couldn't. Not having to do anything is what is the only thing that can save us. We do stuff we ain't going to say. I've learned that in my life. And I'm just thankful to be here. I'd be happy to hear from other people. Um, all praises go to Yahshua. Yahweh. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Our next speaker for this class will be uh, Rochelle Morgan from uh, Ohio. Oh, Illinois. Michelle, are you here with us? Yes, and I love Ohio. Oh, I forgot. I always forget where you're from. <laughs> That's okay. I love Ohio. I would love to be from there. <laughs> Remember, the first time I went to Ohio, it was beautiful. Uh -huh. Good morning, class. Um, <laughs> whew, I enjoyed the remarks of the um, first speaker, which is really the moderator. And then um, Dr. Hughes, he always tells us what's happening. You know, um, can someone get the scripture lesson? This is a school and not a church. And that's something I learned since coming down to the school, the difference from when you go to school and when you go to church, because um, I was, I, you know, my parents sent me to church um, all my life, really, up until high school. So you look at church as some place where you were taught or told you're going to learn about your creator. But in reality, the church I attended, which was a Catholic church, didn't really tell me much about my creator. They told me more about what they, what their interpretation of the creator was versus when I was introduced to this gospel. And I love how it's when you hear certain speakers talk, they'll say, but down at this school, at this gospel, this is what we were taught. And I think that's important as a big separation from this and that, you know. So in this school, I was told that a man had a divine vision in the year 1931. And uh, he had his vision directly from the creator of heaven and earth. And he introduced to him so many things about the truth about our heavenly father, not that which the Catholic or any Christian or other religions try and tell you because um, the Bible was a gift that was given to mankind just like we have a four volume textbook that was given to the human race to tell us about the creator the where he really is and actually exists which is our first aim of the school so in this school we are uh, taught by a divine vision of revelation he goes about to tell you things such as he introduced well for me he introduced to me the name of our heavenly father in his pure spirit state which is Yahweh and when he takes on shape and form 
his title he gave to himself is Elohim, Yahweh Elohim. And that's when the creative state of him and when that spirit uh, and the point of time got into a physical body and work, walked the earth plane as our salvation, his name is Yahshua the Messiah. So those are the things that were taught to me. Now, even though they were taught to me, he also the same, um, you know, person that had this vision, he said, don't believe it because I'm telling you, he went about, can we get First Thessalonians 5 and 21? And that's what Dr. Durrell Hughes was doing, proving things to us. So let's read First Thessalonians 5, 21. And why am I going to the book? I happen to use the Bible. That's a tool that I've been taught to use and really rely on being the truth. And the Bible is not written the way I thought it was. The Bible, the way it's written, you have the first five books being the law. Then you have the remaining 34 books being the prophets, which the world considers the Old Testament. And then you have um, what they call the New Testament, which we call the fulfillment. So it's written law, prophets, and fulfillment. So I'm going by um, to prove things to us. And why is that? Can we read 1 Thessalonians 5 and 21, please? Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And that's what we were taught. Read that whole uh, verse, please. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. That's all I have. Okay, I'll continue, please, if there is another verse Abstain after that. Abstain from all appearance of evil. The very element of peace. I'm sorry, abstain from all things that are evil and... And the very Elohim of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, Yahweh, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of Yahshua the Messiah. Now, they, that that next line, the, the line he just read, uh, where it says, prove, a uh, first line says, prove all things. Once something is proven to you, hold fast to that which is good. And if something is good, that's because it's been shown to, it's been proven to you. Okay, then that next line, read that next line again where it says sustain i believe start there again it says abstain from all abstain of evil. for all of, that's this is what you're supposed to do next once something is proven to you abstain get away from all stay away from all things that what evil is that what it says i don't have it in front of me yes abstain, abstain from yeah. all abstain from all appearance of evil all appearances of evil. And that's why it's so important to really under, try and understand these scriptures. Because then there's a really, even John, he says something about uh, try the spirit, see whether that be of Yahweh. So abstain, abstain from all things that give the appearance of evil. Continue. And the very Elohim of peace sanctify And the you very, holy. I'm going to stop you as we're doing this. And the very Elohim of peace. That tells you what the Holy Spirit brings to us. He brings to us peace. So the very Elohim of peace, which is Yahshua the Messiah, continue. And I pray Yahweh, your whole spirit and soul. No, no, no. You skip the part. Doesn't he say about something about sanctify you? <laughs> the very Elohim of peace sanctify you wholly. And, and the I very Elo Elohim of peace. That's Yahshua the Messiah. Sanctify you holy. Sanctify you. I believe that's like a separation or something. He sanctifies you holy. Continue. And I pray, Yahweh, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of Yahshua the Messiah. Now he said your whole spirit. And this is how I learned how man is made up. He says your whole spirit, your soul, and your body. Is that, is that what he's saying? Yes. Your whole spirit, soul, and body, what about it? Be preserved blameless under the coming of Yahshua the Messiah. Unto the coming of Yahshua the Messiah. So that right there tells us, it told me, I didn't know I was made this way. I didn't know that when I came in class, I walked in class, and I had a physical body. Within that physical body was a soul, and that soul was governed by universal spirit law which has got two manifestations either righteousness or unrighteousness and in this scripture here it tells us about why you have to understand when he talks about why is he using three your whole spirit soul and body because what i've learned since coming down to this school that the creator and this is said on the elementary chart elohim the is the archetype or original pattern of the universe 
I was taught that my creator was a, uh, what is it? They teach in Catholics, they teach um, um, Trinitarian. We, we don't teach that. At this school, at this doctrine, we don't teach a Trinitarian, Trinitarian concept. We teach a unity concept, which is like Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Here are Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim is Yahweh, a unity. He's one. So that's what we teach down at this school. So here you have, and that's why it's so important when we come down here, we do, we can only, as uh, 1 Thessalonians says in 15 and 1, when Paul was talking, he said, I can only give to you that which I received. So if some people are talking and you're not getting anything, they didn't receive anything. And that's so, and that's why we have to try the spirit. And when you try a spirit, you are listening to what's being said by this vessel. And so you come down here and the most important thing that, I mean, there's so many things that I've learned in the purpose of Yahweh. And I had to learn his name. So when I say Yahweh is, let's get John 4, 24, because I said Yahweh is spirit. I'm saying that, but where did I get that from? I got it from the book. And if I don't uh, go by the book, then I'm just giving you my concepts, theories, and opinion. I want to be able to show that what I say, you can go back and do some research on your own. And then something can be proven to you because it was told to me about the names. But then I had to go back and do my research. So it was what? Proven to me. So that's the same thing that happens here. So let's get John 4.24. Yahweh is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So that's what Yahweh is. He is spirit. What is spirit? Spirit, we're saying that Yahweh is spirit, and spirit is made up of these attributes. This is what makes up spirit, um, are the attributes. And in this case, I'm talking about there's only one spirit, first of all, and there's Yahweh. And Yahweh in that pure spirit state has nine divine attributes that we were talking about. The intelligence, the wisdom, the knowledge, the love the beauty, the justice, the foundation, the power, the strength. That's what we're talking about. Yahweh, that's what Yahweh is, not that he, this is that what he possesses. I mean, you know, I possess the gift of gaff. There's nothing. Yahweh talks to us with intelligence, with, with wisdom and knowledge. And that's what he is. He He gives that to us. He shares that with us, with us because he loves us. He wants us. And this is another thing the world doesn't teach. The creator wants you to know him. And not fear him in the way you would fear for your life, but fear him because you want to know the truth about him. You you and you fear that you don't want to do anything that would disrespect what you're learning down here. So you hear you have Yahweh in that pure spirit state. When he takes on that shape and form, he loses no power, and he goes into that Yahweh. He um he goes into that pattern, and he shows you what he is. That pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. That's so hard for the world to conceive that the creator is a pattern. But then he gives all these witnesses. He's proving that he's a pattern because then he goes about to create, create, the creator goes about to create a creation. And the creation happens to be done by a threefold pattern. Everything comes in by a pattern. So you have Yahweh in a pure spirit state taken on shape and form as Yahweh Elohim. Then you have Yahweh when he uh, comes in for our salvation, manifesting himself in or out of a physical body. Why do I use the words in or out of the physical body? Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He can operate in or out of a physical body. Now, the witnesses that uh, I've been taught down at this school, and I'm going to use the most simple one, which is water. That's H2O. It consists of two hydrogens, and one oxygen. Water in that pure spirit state is like a gaseous state. Then you lower that temperature and it becomes a liquid state. And we all desire water because the body is what, 70% water. So you need water to survive. And then, uh, especially during this season, and there's so many droughts going on. You know, uh, someone, I believe Diane talked about the drought that's happening over in, I think she said Hawaii. And again, this takes research because I didn't, I'm just repeating, I didn't check it out yet, but there are so many droughts that are happening now. And so then when you uh, really uh, want something to cool off your liquid, uh, it goes into the state of ice, which is a solid state. So you have water existing as gas, liquid, and solid. And that's a threefold witness proving the existence of Yahweh being pure spirit, 
taking our shape and form. And it says this in the moderation only seen in divine visions and understood by a divine revelation. That means something had been revealed to you to understand it. Then it, and when salvation comes, salvation comes in a body and it walks around the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah. To this day, there is no letter J in the Hebrew, the Greek, or the Latin language. So no J, no Jesus. We don't preach that. So these are tools that you use while you're out here in the world and you're doing everyday existence, everyday investigation on our creator, Yahweh. And this is what we come down to this school to tell and to share what we've learned since being here about our creator, Yahweh, through his son, Yahshua, the Messiah. And we try and teach you the process of learning something about our creator. You know, and that's that's what I've learned since coming down here. The stuff I'm repeating was not taught to me in school. And I've been in Catholic school forever. None of this. And then I even went back and brought those tools. Some of the, um, we have uh, tablets, not tablets. We have those uh, pamphlets. And we have the name pamphlet. And I remember bringing that to my priest and, you know, showing it to him. And the priest that came to my house ate with my family. I grew up with the whole familyhood of priests that I grew up with, because I grew up with a lot of Italian priests and, um, you know, Polish priests. I even had a priest from Africa. So I've had a, a variety of priests that I grew up with, and they all knew the names of Yahweh. They were not dispersed, you know, arguing with me about this. They said, yes, we were taught this. But they still wanted me to come back to them and be a good little Catholic girl, even though I had the knowledge of truth. And when I asked my priest why we were not taught this, he used the words, it's more profitable for us to tell the people about Lord, God, and Jesus Christ. And that was a big separation of church for me then. And I haven't been back since. And I'm so grateful that Yahshua has taken me and taught me the things that I'm sharing with this class today. So we're not worshiping the man. I'm so glad Dr. Kinley had the vision, but even Dr. Kinley said, don't worship him. And it's just like when those that angel came in the revelation and uh, John got down to praise this angel and the angel was like, get up. I'm a man just like you. So this is why we don't worship one another. We learn from one another because hopefully, and which I've been, I've seen and I know that the Holy Spirit does speak through vessels and the sharing things that they've learned with us. So our, just like when the apostles walked around, they used uh, parchment, they said, and they went from place to place to talk and share things about the creator. We're doing the self-same thing now. We're using tools like Zoom, like this phone call I'm having, to talk about the Heavenly Father, because Yahweh wants you to know him, and he wants you to talk about him and tell people about him and share the, this is this is the purpose happening right in front of you this is what we go through now i want to go a little bit over the scripture lesson can we get the first part of the scripture lesson please deuteronomy 10 and one, one. go ahead Kath. at that time yahweh said unto me hew thee two tables of stones like an under the first and come up unto me in the mount and make thee an ark of wood and I will write on the stone on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest and thou now, shalt if you don't know what they're talking about we have to take you back can someone get us Luke 24 and 25 and read down because we have to well, this, is, this is what was done to given to me out of love because I didn't know about the uh, what was happening under the law and how that name was given to them and the laws were given to them under the law. So here, uh, under the fulfillment, the apostles tells us, if you want to know something about what happened, start, ready to start. Let's get that bread, please. Luke. Verse 25. Then he yes, said sir. unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all the prophets have spoken, ought not Yahshua to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning in Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's what we had to be taught. We were fools and slow of heart to believe. We didn't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And and he tells us where to start. He said, don't you know 
beginning at Moses. Now remember, we're talking the law of prophets and fulfillment. Under that law, the Hebrew people were the only people given these things. So it wasn't given to me. I'm a Gentile. But he tells us where to start. He said, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, everything they wrote about was concerning Yahshua himself. And that's a beautiful way to know the truth from a lie. So then when you go back and you begin at Moses, then you have to pick up your understand why there was a, what do you call a Exodus before a Genesis, if I could say it that way. And so where he's reading now in the book of um, Deuteronomy, where he says, hew out thyself two stones. Well, you have to know, well, why is he hewing out two stones? You got to go all the way back to Moses at that third verse, when you realize who Moses was and how he was a, a child born. And then you have to go back into that death decree. Then the principles that you learn about when you're doing all this research in Genesis, I mean, in Exodus, you go into, you find out there was a death decree, there was a burial, and there was a resurrection. These are what we teach down here at this school. We teach the death, the burial, the resurrection of Yahshua Messiah to come because it was established under the law. So when he came in, he fulfilled everything. That's why right now you don't see us talking about, oh, you all need to get water baptized and did you give your tithing this, this time and all that kind of stuff. We don't bring that up because it's been fulfilled. And when I try and share with people that I know and love, hey, you don't have to baptize your baby. Uh, you don't have to uh, give tidings to. There you go. Thank you, Greg. Those uh, that was that's those laws that were given to them. It was uh, it's being fulfilled with Yahshua and Messiah. Okay, so that's why we don't teach foot washing and baptizing because all that stuff has been fulfilled. And you don't have to take. Can someone just grab uh, where he says that? It's in here in Matthew three or Matthew five seventeen. He talks about being something being fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17. Thank Think you. not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So for see, verily that's I, he, continue, I'm sorry. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. See, everything was being fulfilled under that law. And again, Christianity only talks about the Ten Commandments. Wouldn't that have been so nice? Because it may have been easy for them to keep Ten Commandments. It wasn't for me. But there was not only Ten Commandments. There was 600, I believe, in 13 law commandments and ordinances. And that was given in the book of Exodus. Okay? And so they were given these things, this law. And so then... Uh, because of disobedience, they broke that law. And now you're reading over in Deuteronomy where he said, well, let me let me tell you, but since you broke this law, I have to give it to you again. So then um, everything is repeating itself. There's such a beautiful story to know all the details. And unfortunately, we don't have the time to go into all the details of what's being said. And just using that first part of that scripture, because it takes you back to the law where you have to explain to people about uh, why was there a death decree? Why was there a resurrection? Why was there a burial? All those things. But you can see they were established under that law. And the wonderful thing about coming to the school, you have to do just like with regular school. You cannot come one time and think you're going to graduate. And people that have been around us, those of us that are recipients of the Holy Spirit, they always say we say the same old thing and you are here the same old thing, but you don't. Each time I come to class, I'm, I mean, I thank Yahshua. He always shows me something that I didn't know before. And that's a mm -hmm. joy. Because you're not going to learn everything in one session. And, and you didn't learn your ABCs in one session. And what proof do I have of that? You've got more kids right now in the public school or any school system in the world where some of them are not reading. Uh, some of them are not being taught to read. They're not even taught to do cursive writing anymore. You know, there's so many things that the schools don't do or give to our kids anymore. And that happens down here also at our school. Uh, there are so many kids that are coming up. We have um, went. OK, the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research is a wonderful place to come and learn if you're at the right school where things are being taught correctly, because I'm learning that some schools are not teaching what Dr. Kinley taught. They're teaching something else. And I wanted in the scripture where it says if they're teaching something other than this, 
Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, find that for me, please, because that's what's happening. And I had I had a witness of that. I was listening to Springfield, Illinois class um, a couple of weeks ago, and some guy was visiting from Virginia, and he he when he got up to speak, he said, "I don't want to talk about." any of this doctrine and stuff that we teach down that you all teach at your school. I just want to tell you how wonderful um, Aaron Bryan is and how, how brilliant Aaron Bryan was. And I just, I just want to talk about that. And, um, you know, he said he had to go and visit Dr. Bryan in um, California. And when he went to visit him, he said he spoke with him from two hours and they talked, but he did not share with us what they talked about. But he walked away saying the biggest thing we have to do now is to be kind to one another and, and just be very kind. Then the next speaker got up and she was very kind because all she did was preach the gospel. And from that, I said the best thing we could ever do for one another in this kindness that the world is looking for is to tell you the truth, tell you the truth about the death, the burial, the resurrection and what Yahshua did for the saving of a soul. If you believe in the saving of a soul. Well, these kids that are in certain parts of IDMR, they're not being taught about the death, the burial, the resurrection. They're not being taught about the saving of a soul. Can someone give me uh, Psalms 19 and 7, please? Because this is what this school, this is what this doctrine teaches us, that we're made of body, soul, and spirit. Your physical body is going to die, but within that body was a, was a, that soul. And that soul has to go on in one state or the other. And you want to go Go on, as I said in Romans, in that peace, that joy, that righteousness, because that's what it's like to be in the body of Yahshua, the Messiah. These are the gifts that you will be given. This is what that armor is. When we, he said there's a hedge about you. There's a hedge of kindness. There's a hedge of truth about you. And this is what you preach. Do you, did you find that one scripture? Do you have Psalms? 19 and 7. The law of Yahweh okay. is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. Now it says the, the law of Yahweh is perfect. Well, I had to come down to the school to learn. But what the heck is the law of Yahweh? The law of Yahweh is Yahweh Elohim. If you go back to that Mosaic chart, you see Yahweh in that pure spirit state. When he steps into that shape and form as Yahweh Elohim, that is the law of Yahweh. That is the only perfection that will be. You will not find perfection in us. Why? Because we're in a physical body. And as long as we're in a physical body, we will need a savior. Something is going to be there. Because see, Satan, once, even if you become a recipient of the Holy Spirit, Satan, that, that adversary does not stop bothering you, trying to get you back. He does not stop. He doesn't. Now, you've got that hedge about you, that peace, joy, and righteousness, and that's, but they don't stop him from trying to get in. Did you find that one scripture I was talking about, Kathy? Um, it, I found something like it. I don't okay, know if it's it. Revelation 22. It's not in Revelation. The Galatians 3.19. About... Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Galatians 1.9. Go ahead and read it, Greg. But though we or this is Galatians 1 and 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As That's we said, all. Continue, Greg. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And what we're saying, what we received, I have to use me, what I received, just like Paul says, what is this, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1, I received the death, the, what Yahshua did for the saving of my soul, how he converted my soul through that death, that burial, this resurrection of a soul. And your soul was under that cardinal state and to go from death unto life. This is what we preach. But guess what? These kids down here now are not getting the, the, the little bit that we got when we first came in class. They don't even want to talk about the names in anymore. They don't want to give the praise, honor, and glory to whatever they're talking about. It doesn't go to a man. It goes to Yahshua, the Messiah. He's, I said before, when he took on that shape and form, he 
He's seen a divine vision and he's understood by a revelation. They're not getting a revelation because no nothing is being told to them to be revealed. They're, they're telling them stuff that we were not taught. So that's why it's a blessing that you come to a class where they're teaching that which they received, the truth they received from our founder, Ms. Dr. Kinley. He wasn't trying to get any glory. He was telling what the creator told him to say he, to when he asked the question, when he received this vision, what will you do with that which you have been shown? And he didn't know what to say. Yahweh had to get inside that man and said, teach thy people thy will, O Yahweh. That's all we're trying to tell you. We're trying to teach you the purpose of Yahshua and why he came in and why his name means salvation. Yahweh is salvation. Mm -hmm. It's over in Matthew. Go ahead, Matthew 121. These are not just my words. His own mama told you what his name meant. An angel told his mother what his name was going to mean. So let's read that real fast. Matthew she one. Shall, oh, go ahead. And she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. See, he shall save his people from their sin. Yes, we are born under uh, the 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 uh, cardinal orders. We were, you know, born under that stuff. That stuff was, you know, taught to us. But if you become a recipient of this gospel, you have a chance to get the, the changing of a, the, what did it say, Psalms 19 and 1, the converting of your soul. Your soul should be the most important thing that you have knowledge of the things that you live for is for your soul to be saved because you don't live for this flesh you're gonna die who wants to stay here there's so much stuff happening daily hourly we are sitting at the edge of our seats going okay Yahshua the, what you need to be learning so that you are well equipped so that when these things, these trials and tribulations come knocking at your door, you are standing in the holy place. You're standing someplace where, yes, I can understand this. Yes. And, and so what if you get sick? All because we have an understanding. That doesn't mean that the sun doesn't shine on the good and the bad. But when you get sick, you know you're not going to stay in that state forever. Yahshua takes care of his sons. Yahshua makes sure that we are being cared for. We're just trying to teach you about the love of the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. We don't want you. I was ignorant all my life under that Christianity concept of that Trinitarian concept. All those things that were teaching us. You have holidays that are coming and going and people are clinging to these holidays. They're, they're waiting for Thanksgiving so they can all go and visit each other and treat each other nice for that one day, for that couple of hours. Then they go back to being what they really are, mean and evil. We don't teach that. We want you to love one another with that kindness of truth 24-7. These are the armors that we tell you about. This is the knowledge we tell you about. And I am so excited. I, I can't even... It, you know, I'm excited. I love this gospel. This is a life changing experience. This is a way of life, not just on Wednesday, Sunday, whatever days you all meet. This is everyday existence so that you do not be consumed with the darkness that's happening out here in the world on the daily. And when you hear about it, it doesn't make your heart just what they say. Let not get that scripture. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither. Neither. Let it be afraid. You ain't got to be afraid of this. This is for your salvation. Yahshua's got you. We teach that Yahshua's got you. I'm going to have that read, then I'm going to get off the floor. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in Yahweh. Believe also in me. Continue. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. There you may be also. He is not lying. And I pray that we've got something where we can be with the Messiah also, always, daily, talking to him to hold us together as the world is falling apart. And with that, I'll, I'll yield the floor. And if you got anything from it, I give all praise, honor, and glory to my Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan. And our next speaker for today is Dr. Susan Sukowski from our Rhode Island class. 
Thank you, and good afternoon to everybody. Good afternoon. Um, <laughs> I always have to take a deep breath after Rochelle stops talking. Um, the energy and the, um, it's like she's running a marathon um, as she presents those things that she loves and has, has seen and is sharing with us. Um, oh, a number of thoughts from what has been talked about. Rochelle made a point of saying that we are a school and not a church. And so when you think about a school, um, actually, can we get the word school from the dictionary, please? Um, this is unlike any school, I would venture to say that any of us had attended from a natural standpoint in our past. And um, doesn't matter how many years of schooling that you've had or what types of things you may have um, taken that you were interested in. Um, this school is so far different than the world's view of a school and of what goes on in a school. Uh, most people think back and it was not something that most kids wanted to go to. Um, you didn't get up just eagerly waiting to go to school every morning. Um, you couldn't wait to have summers off. You couldn't wait to have no homework or snow days or things like that. School was not something that for the most part, um, when we were younger, it was that grabbed us, drew us in, made us want to go there. This school is different. When you see the kinds of things, the opportunity that you have to learn about your creator and to learn something about the world that you're living in, um, your own life, um, the things that you study from the perspective of the creator and um, the purpose that we're all participating in and can learn the mind of the creator. Um, it's a whole different experience. And I think Rochelle used that word. Um, di dictionary definition of school, please. School. First definition, any institution devoted primarily to the imparting of knowledge or to developing certain skills or talents, especially an educational institution for children. All right, so we are an educational institution. Um, we are formally and legally a school, and we are dedicated to teaching about Yahweh, about our creator, about his purpose. Um, our first aim is to help you learn and know about Yahweh. Um, and we all participate in that. Now, a school, um, in a school, you generally have teachers and you have students and you have different types of classes and subjects that um, get taught and are learned. In this class, we are all both a teacher and a student. And it doesn't matter how long you have been coming to this school or attending these classes, you stay in both those roles or positions for as long as you're around. We each come here and we may be called on to share what we have learned with others, but we all also sit as an audience to receive what other people have learned and want to share with us. And those things that are revealed to us by Yahweh, by the Holy Spirit, are those gems that we get as we sit in a class and open, have our minds open, our hearts open, our ears, our spiritual ears open to receiving those things that we can learn about and know and 
as Rochelle talked about, prove, check out, research, and make part of us. And that's what develops our spiritual bodies and the mind of um, a, a sincere person, um, a sincere vessel wanting to know about the creator. We ask that people pay attention. Um, we ask that to ourselves that for this, especially the time we have dedicated to a class, but not just the couple of two hours here and there, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that we try to keep our mind focused on what the creator may be showing us. And it could be through our own lives. It could be through current events, could be through the things we might study. It could be through our jobs, our relationships. There's never a lack of something for us to learn from. And if we're, we occasionally um, hear somebody say that it does sound like there's a repetition or that something might be boring. Well, that's because we're not listening with the ears to try and understand something. Um, our creator is never not showing us something. As it talks about in Psalms 19, day unto day utters speech, night unto night shows forth knowledge. There's no place, no language, no geography, no place in the world that our creator is not constantly showing us something. So if we feel like we're not learning, it's probably because we're not paying attention. Um, right. And it's a joy to recognize that we can be both a student and a teacher and that it is a very humbling situation as Daryl was talking about to realize how much we have been given, how much we have been shown um, both to um, enrich our own spiritual body, to try and grow that spiritual body, but also to share with others. And um, there is no end of opportunity to do that these days, particularly with the Zoom calls and the opportunity that the um, technology has has given all of us. Now, um, a couple of things along the lines of what I'm talking about. Can we go in to get in John 14? Um, let's start, I think, around 15. I want to pick up um, with the couple of sections in there about the comforter. And this is Yahshua speaking. If you have a red letter version of your Bible, you're going to see that this is in red font. Um, the Messiah is speaking to the disciples. And let's start at um, 15, John 14, 15, please. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. All right. So Yahshua is saying he's going to pray to the Father. And the Father will give you another comforter, which implies that there already is a comforter um, whom he identifies actually as himself. He's with them. He's um, Elohim with them. He's El Shaddai. He's Emmanuel. He's um, the one that when they're scared or they're challenged or they're confused, he's supports them. He explains things. He tries to provide um, something that um, comforts them um, as they're walking on this journey with him through his ministry. And he, so this another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So he has been talking with them about not being around forever with them. And the discussions about being crucified and this time will come, um, all of which, of course, made them very unsettled and very concerned. But he's trying to reassure them there's going to be another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Read. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. All right, so this other comforter that will abide with them forever is the spirit of truth. 
And he makes a point of saying the world cannot receive this spirit of truth because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, <clears throat> excuse me, and shall be in you. So you need special eyes to see him. You need a special mind um, to know him. And they are going to know him because he's dwelling with them as Yahshua the Messiah in the likeness of sinful flesh, but he shall be in you. And that happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out and um, it took place or took residence in the disciples. And he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So he's talking about this comforter. And then if you go down to 14, starting at 25, please, we'll pick up the, the rest of the discussion about the comforter. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. All right. So this comforter, who is the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit that the Father will send, he will teach you all things. So this puts a bit of a different perspective on being a teacher in this school um, with this gospel, this incredible gospel that we've been um, privy to, because it's the Holy Spirit teaching all things. Um, it's not because we went to school, Daryl mentioned he had been in seminary school. It's not because Daryl had gone to seminary school. It's not because I took some college courses. It's not because somebody else maybe took training in some um, vocational type of program. That's not where we get our um, ability and, and the material, most importantly, the source and substance of what we're able to teach from. It's from the comforter or the Holy Spirit in us that has shown us the things that we understand. And um, in this school, also, there is no graduation. Um, you never get to the end of learning. Um, so for those who feel like they want to have something that gets finalized and they get a certificate and then somehow you become a great authority or have something to hang on your wall. Um, none of that, which is worldly perspective of schools and teaching and graduation, none of that is applicable to this teaching. This gospel just is ever learning, um, ever seeing increasingly different facets of the knowledge that we've been given. Um, you come to class and you think you understand you know, this particular principle that we've talked about often, and then somebody says something in a certain way, and all of a sudden, it opens up an understanding, a different facet in, in your, um, a light bulb goes on, like they would show you in a cartoon. And you see a whole different piece of something that then spurs you on to looking at something different or looking at something more deeply. And that's the excitement about learning in the school and that you could tell from Rochelle when she was teaching that has stimulated her thinking, has motivated her, has inspired her. Um, I was thinking a little bit because of Veterans Day, what the word veteran means. And for the celebration of that holiday, it's about people who have served in the military and are no longer in active duty so that they, um, they have re retired, so to speak, or, or have left the military, but had years of experience or served in some way um, in the armed forces. And veteran is also used um, as a term to describe somebody with experience and expertise in something. Um, so that's what the Holy Spirit really does for us, causes us to have experience and um, expertise. And for a number of us, you know, you think back on how long we've been in class and how much knowledge and understanding we've been given, and it could fill um, a library. It could fill um, multiple libraries. Um, the 
um, different places when you think about where in, in the past you'd go to study or research or whatever. And it just continues to grow and to expand. So studying and learning, it, it's um, an incredibly inspiring and, and motivational type of thing. Now, um, if we go, let's see, um, let me pick up on something else that it w- the what the speakers had talked about was making me think about. Um, if we go back into Deuteronomy 10, and let me go back there with you so I can tell you where I'd like to read. Um, okay, let's let's pick up. Oh, there's so much here. Um, actually, let's go into, um, I'm going to pick up the same story, but in a different version. Let's go into Exodus, I think it's 34, where he's picking up the original. Yes. Deuteronomy is a retelling. And so here we're getting um, Moses and a look back a retrospective of what has happened to israel with what yahweh has been working with them down in egypt and then into the wilderness of sinai and then into canaan's land in the book of deuteronomy but the original um episodes of a lot of the things you read in deuteronomy are back in exodus and leviticus etc so let's go back to exodus 34 um Read the first verse for me, and then we're going to skip down. Okay, Exodus 34, verse 1. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest. All right, so you'll see that that's the same thing that's written in Deuteronomy 10.1 that we read in the scripture reading. Mm -hmm. Moses is instructed by Yahweh to hew out two tables of stone like unto the first and then bring those up into the mountain. And in the meantime, he's also told to make an ark of wood to put the tables in. So we, if you go back a little bit in time, Moses was called up into the mountain. Yahweh gave him tables of stone that had the 10 commandments written on them. And he came down and he saw the people worshiping the golden Um, image the golden calf that was made and they had said you know let us make gods to take us back into Egypt because we don't know what happened to this man Moses he went up into this fiery cloud at the top of the mountain and he's been up there for a very long time he was up there on that first trip for 40 days and we read he went up on the second trip when he took the stones back up that he had to hew out And he was again up there for 40 days. So the people thinking, you know, no way is he going to live through that. And somehow we need somebody to take us back. Interestingly, they didn't think about somebody to take them forward to go to the promised land. They immediately reverted to what they had known and where they came from. And that's something that we sometimes find ourselves doing when we when things get tough or we um, have a challenge ahead of us and we're not sure what to do next, um, going backwards is not the, the right answer. Going forward to what Yahweh has put out there as a promise to us and looking forward to what he has put in front of us is the mindset that we really want to have. But the first generation of Israel is manifesting that heart and that mind of not trusting Yahweh, not believing in what was promised, mm-hmm. And in wanting to go back to Egypt, which if you read how they describe Egypt, it's with what I call rose colored glasses that Mm -hmm. using that Mm -hmm. phrase, they remember, you know, some of the foods that they liked and, and all this, they don't talk anything about the bondage, the slavery, the make bricks with no straw. They are, have a very selective memory when it was time to kind of figure out what to do next. And they reverted to thinking about, the old ways must be, you know, that's where our salvation is. And that's the state of the natural carnal mind. Um, and that's not the, the mind that, and heart that Yahweh um, 
was going to save and was going to reward with the promised land. So we find that the, that whole first generation, they died before they um, the people got to Jordan River and, and Canaan's land. But back to what we were talking about, Yahweh, for the second trip, um, said to Moses, hew out stones, bring them up. I'll write on them what I wrote on the first ones. And then Moses was up there for um, a long stretch again. He was up there for another 40 days. So if we go in, we're in Exodus 34. And if we go down to the end of the chapter, after it goes through um, what we already know from Deuteronomy, um, let's see, pick it up at 27, if you would. 27. Uh, Exodus 34, 27. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Write thou these words, for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. And he was there with Yahweh 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant and the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the Mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. All right. So when Moses was up there for the second trip, we talk about the, let's go back for a moment. We talk about the first trip and he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. He got the 10 commandment law. Um, written on the tables of stone, which subsequently got broken when he threw them down. But he also got the um, uh, understanding and the, the visual representation of what happened in, in the days of creation. And um, it is an incredible mystery to the world, if you are to ask people about this, how do we know what happened that is written about in Genesis, the first chapter, the, the six days of creation, who saw that to have the knowledge in order to write that? Because as you read it, you realize man came in on the sixth day and there's a whole description of what happened on the first five days that man wasn't around to experience or to know about. Um, how, how did he know? How did Moses know because if you read at the beginning of each of these books, it'll say the first book of Moses called Genesis, the second book of Moses called Exodus. Um, how did Moses know what to write since there was no human around for the first five days to even know what happened? And um, most people don't think about that. If somebody doesn't pose that question to you, um, you, you wouldn't even necessarily ever think of that. But we right. find out, that um, in reading in the book of Exodus and Moses up at the top of the mountain in that trip, that he actually had a vision and a revelation of what Yahweh did. Yahweh showed him a representation of bringing in the, the days of creation. And he also showed him um, the information about a tabernacle, a building called the tabernacle, where Yahweh said he would dwell and what the vessels and the structure and function of that tabernacle um, were to look like. So that when Moses came down, he would have that tabernacle built um, with the assistance of Yahweh putting his Holy Spirit in Aeoliab and Bezalel so that they could be skilled workmen in order to make a tabernacle according to the instructions of Yahweh and make it exactly as was needed so that it was a perfect representation of what Yahweh said would be um, an image and likeness. I'm blending a few things here, I'm, I realize, but um, that tabernacle was a representation of the word made flesh or Yahweh, um, a, a dwelling place for Yahweh among the children of Israel. And so that happened on the first trip up. And then the second trip, when Moses was up there, he got the tables of stone with the words again written on them um, that had, had been on the first one. And then he also got to see some things. And um, what he saw made his the skin of his face shine. Um, and when he came down, um, keep reading where you are, Kathy, I guess, 30, um, 30 and down.
Sorry about that. I was muted. I'm sorry. 30. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh on. All right. And so that really put people off. If you came across someone you knew, um, he had been up in that mountain for 40 days again. So again, the people were probably speculating, like, where the heck is he? And is he coming back? Um, But you see him and his face is shining. That's going to be very off-putting to to people. Um, You're not going to know, like, what happened to him up there and why does he look like this? Keep reading. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that Yahweh had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. All right. And so to deal with how people were reacting to him, And the fact that his face shone, he put a veil over his face while he was speaking with the people. Continue reading. Mm -hmm. But when Moses went in before Yahweh to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. All right. And so this is um, manifesting or um, describing something that uh, happened to Moses when he was up there on that second trip. He saw things that so affected him that his face shone or that he was lit up. He was illuminated. He was um, uh, just, there was an internal um, illumination to Moses that he didn't have when he went up the mountain that second time, but when he came down, it reflected what Yahweh had um, done with him, had shown him, had explained to him. And that's um, a manifestation of what the revelation of um, a knowledge of Yahweh's purpose, pattern and plan, which Moses saw to some degree while he was up there, um, what it can do for you, what it can do for me, for us. Um, mm-hmm. it, it lights us up from the inside. It provides um, illumination of understanding. Um, if we go into, let's see, Second Corinthians, the third chapter, um, it discusses the difference between the Old and the New Covenant in that chapter, the Old and the New Testament. And um, it makes reference, Paul makes reference back to this state of Moses to also reiterate um, how how the concept of a veil um, or needing to have something that covers up something works with the the testaments. Now, let's see. Um, let's start at three one, and then we'll we'll read a bit, and then probably jump down here. Um, three and one. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? All right. Now, this is speaking. um, I'm sorry. I'm going to just continue to interrupt. (laughs) I know you know that it's rude, but I don't mean to be rude. Um, From a natural standpoint in the world, people look for um, commendations, letters of commendation in order to decide whether they believe somebody is an expert or um, should be listened to, um, what their qualifications are, what their credentials are. The world carries, cares a lot about those things. And that can be a major stumbling stone to try and hear the words of the gospel. 
because we don't look like what the world considers experts. We don't look like what people think um, the ministers of um, the creator and the, the true gospel would look like. We don't have the background. We don't have the papers. Um, we're not necessarily eloquent of speech, um, not charismatic. We just are inspired by the Holy Spirit to share what we've, what we've been shown. And um, that's not necessarily what the world is looking for or expects to see in um, what they think God will look like or sound like when he talks to them. So um, this whole thing about letters of commendation, et cetera, Paul's trying to make a point that that's not what you're going to see. That's not what you should be looking for. Keep reading. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of the Messiah ministered by us, written not with ink, <clears throat> but with the spirit of the living Elohim, not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. All right, so we go back to Moses with his tables of stone that Yahweh Elohim wrote the Ten Commandments in with the finger of Yahweh, or finger of Elohim, it's, as it's written about back in Exodus. We are an epistle or a message or a communication written in our hearts to be known and read of all men. So it's sincere. It's um, the... Deuteronomy 10 picked up about circumcise the foreskin of your hearts mm -hmm. and so that you have sincerity and truth that are being spoken and communicated, not as the world communicates things or does things. And we're declared to be an epistle, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living Elohim, the finger of Elohim that wrote in those tables of stone has written in our hearts and in our minds. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to, to bring down to the people, so to speak, from the top of the mountain and what causes our faces to shine while we're able to, to share with them what has happened to us, what we have experienced and why we could be um, called a veteran, so to speak, of this gospel. Um, keep reading, Wally, please. Uh, verse 5, not that we are not for, and such trust have we through Yahshua, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of Yahweh, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. All right, so our sufficiency, our abilities, our skills, um, anything that we have is really of, of Elohim, of Yahweh Elohim or of Yahshua in us. Um, it's not because we have studied so hard. We have wanted to be teachers. Um, we have, we know where a lot of scriptures are. Um, none of that is what, um, causes our ability to share the things about Yahweh and Yahshua to be effective or to be um, heard. And also on the receiving end, it, it's not the great skill and the great ability to um, orate, um, to communicate that causes somebody to hear what we try to share. It's the fact that Yahweh allows them, allows someone to hear and to understand and to receive what we share as teachers. Um, and it's through the spirit, not through the letter. Um, keep reading. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. All right, so now Paul's going to make a correlation here. And he talks about the tables of stone, that second set that Moses came down with, 
and that that experience he had up in the mountain on that second trip, if that, if people couldn't stand to look at Moses' face for what went on there, and that was to be done away with, those tables of stone, that Ten Commandment law, the covenant with all the hundreds of, of ordinances that Yahweh gave them, that actually was fulfilled and ushered out um, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua, he was fulfilling, as one of the previous speakers showed us. And um, all of that was taken away, and a new covenant, a new testament, was ushered in on the day of Pentecost when the law was put within the people. Um, the law was put in our heart, in our mind, in that old covenant um, on the left side of the chart that you're looking at. Um, those things were taken away. They were fulfilled. They were ended. Their purpose had come to uh, a designed end, which is what the word fulfill means. And through Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection, and pouring out of his spirit on the day of Pentecost, we have been brought into a spiritual kingdom, which has um, all of the things that we're seeing written on that heart on the right-hand side of the chart. And so Paul saying if what was what happened on the mountain and the bringing down of the tables of stone and the writing of those laws on that um, in the book of the law that was put into the Ark of the Covenant, if all of those things um, happened and were glorious in their own way, then um, keep reading, Wally. How shall not the ministration of the spirit be rather glorious? All right. And so if now it's being done in the spirit, not written with pen and ink, not written on pieces of paper, not written on tables of stone, but written in your heart and in your mind. If it's in that that sincere heart, those ears that are open, that mind that wants to hear and just can't get enough to 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 eat from a natural study standpoint, the spiritual food that Yahweh pours out. Um, how much more, um, verse nine, verse nine, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more that the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. All right. So now we're under a ministration of righteousness. Read. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remain is glorious. All right. So Paul's saying if there was glory to what had been in place with the old covenant and that was done away, how much more, how much more better, how much um, <laughs> incredibly multiplied better is the new covenant? He can't, can't even compare the two in reality. Read. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. All right, and so he's referring again to that veil that we read about in Exodus, and the children of Israel couldn't steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. They, they were too disturbed by the um by moses's face shining they didn't want to have to look at um what was what had happened to him they were scared they were put off they were afraid they were um uh, they averted their their view, their eyes from looking at that they couldn't deal with um what yahweh had given to moses and it says to the end of that which was abolished and what was being abolished is the Old Testament that they were living under and their their mind and their hearts, which we read in Deuteronomy 5.29, oh, that there was a heart in them, that they would be obedient unto Yahweh, that they would love Yahweh, they would follow his commandments. It wasn't in them to do that. So they essentially were what were going to be abolished if they could really see what Moses had seen when he was up at the top of the mountain. Read 14. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in the Messiah. 
All right. And to this day, when Paul is writing this, it's around AD 60. So it's quite a while after the day of Pentecost and after Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection, um, after when the early um, assembly had gotten started with the disciples, or apostles going out to preach and, and all of that, at that time and still to today, it's a current event, still to today, their minds are blinded because the same veil remains untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which the veil was done away in Yahshua, but it did not come off their hearts and their minds. So they have not seen that there's this new spiritual um, ministration that's written in your heart and in your mind that has taken away all of these old things. And you can tell that because you go to church on Sunday. I don't care what um, creed or what facet of Christianity or other types of belief out there they are still all caught up on natural, physical things, ceremonies, um, water baptisms, Lord's suppers, Ten Commandment laws, all of these things that were in place um, back under the Old Covenant, back before the time of the Messiah coming in and his ministry to fulfill things. Those are the things the churches are still teaching you need to be done, need to be followed, that are, they're still in effect. And that is a witness to the fact that the veil is still not taken away in their reading of what has happened or in their practicing of what they think happened with the Messiah. You hear them talk about Jesus instituting a Christian way of life or instituting water baptism or whatever it is. And instituting is the exact opposite of what he did. So without checking into these things um if we go back for a moment to reference the scripture um one of the speakers got in thessalonians about prove all things proof means to check it out means to test it means to um go go back in and find out for yourself whether or not um what we're saying versus what you may have heard in church or some other kind of religious philosophy um belief that you have you check it out and you figure out who's telling the truth because truth is the only way that you're going to have um, stability and foundation in this world and in your spiritual salvation. Um, so we're, we're here with the, the veil still not done away with um, even though Yahshua did take the veil away, it's still on their hearts and on their minds. Um, now we're going to skip down for a moment and go down into chapter four. Um, let's see, pick it up at one, if you would. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of Yahweh deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of Yahweh. All right. And so we, he continues on, we have a ministry and we have received mercy. We have been, um, none of us have are righteous. None of us deserved to have this revelation that we've been given, but we appreciate so much the grace and the mercy and the blessing um, that we have been given and the outcome or something that it causes to happen in verse two causes us to renounce the hidden things and dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, handling the word of Yahweh deceitfully, but manifesting the truth. Um, that's the nature of the, um, the new heart, the new mind, the new man that was brought in under this new covenant. Now, um, I'll get back to that in a moment, but um, keep on reading, Wally. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Yahshua, who is the image of Elohim, should shine unto them. 
All right. So there mm-hmm. is a God of this world or a mystery of iniquity that has covered who's who is very good at covering up the truth and distracting people from um, looking at the truth and from not hearing the word of Yahweh as it um, gets preached and um, prevents the light of the glorious gospel um, from shining unto them. Read. For we preach not ourselves, but Yahshua the Messiah. And ourselves, your servant, for Yahshua's sake. All right. And it's so important that we realize that we're not preaching ourselves. Um, we're preaching Yahweh, um, Yahweh's purpose, Yahweh's salvation. We're preaching Yahshua. Um, and read six, please. For Elohim, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh in the face of Yahshua the Messiah. All right, so that's what caused Moses' face to shine. It was the manifestation or the example or what happened to him back there. The, Yahweh commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, shined in his heart, and is shining in ours to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of Elohim in the face of Yahshua the Messiah. And so it's a wonderful thing to behold that light shining from somebody that is the truth and is that illumination of understanding and revelation that comes from within. Um, Now, going back for a moment, it talks about, um, or I started talking about the um, verse two and how there's a difference that has happened. There's a change that occurs and he, Paul's contrasting it no longer hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, handling the word of Yahweh deceitfully, but now manifesting the truth is um, uh, part of what we now have as our nature and what happens within us. And so just um, an additional thought I don't know if anybody else has done the um, where you can go into like ancestry or one of those other places and you kind of look up your family roots or you have DNA stuff um, looked up. And I occasionally will get an email from ancestry um, because I did have the family information looked up in the past. And they'll tell me that that I have a relative, um, a new relative that they found. And, um, uh, you know, with the, I guess, the expectation that I would just rush out and want to contact these people, um, which is not what what happens. But um, I got thinking about that when I got a recent email about how we have a spiritual, we have a physical ancestry, forefathers, lineage, family tree, um, which is a big thing these days of people wanting to look at what their roots are and where they come from and their source and their substance. And Um, So there's a natural process in this natural database that's being kept and notifications to you and stuff. And then it got me thinking about the spiritual counterpart of that, where um, could somebody read our second aim for me, please, where we are interested in the spiritual version of a family tree or of finding um, long lost relatives that can be added to to our family, um, our knowledge of our family. Um, so one of our aims talks about something related to this, if somebody would read that. Second aim, to uh, form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. All right, so one of our aims is to, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood in Yahshua the Messiah. So this is not a physical family. Um, People have reunions and everybody with the name of, um, I don't know, um, Smith gets together and um, all the generations and they wear t-shirts and it's a big deal to kind of find out who all your, your relatives are. And Um, we're hoping to find the spiritual relatives, the spiritual brethren that are out there that um, are not necessarily yet part of the known family that we're part of. And what what binds or um, joins or unites a family um, 
from a just a purely physical natural standpoint is that you share DNA, you share genetic material that um, comes from the mother and and the father and um, people can take a look at this DNA and they'll know um, like when they do paternity tests, for example, they'll know who the, your um, your mother and your father may be by comparing um, who you believe are they are, and then checking to see what on a molecular um, uh, what the bases, the DNA bases are. You hear them talk about that there's four different bases or components of the DNA pairing that they look at in your genes. And in our case, the family has the same spiritual DNA, um, the basis of YHWH manifested through Yahshua, um, Yahweh is salvation. And that's our family name. And that's our family tree and the heritage or the, um, the lineage that we come from. And there are, um, in genetic material, there's certain things that cause you to have certain traits, um, possibly the color of your eyes, the color of your hair, um, certain other um, things that they have identified come from th this genetic material. And um, in thinking about verse two, there's certain characteristics that come from your family lineage in the spirit. And you do leave behind um, the hidden things, dishonesty, craftiness, holding the word of Yahweh um, in, in deceit. Um, all those things are left behind. They're not your spiritual lineage. They're not your spiritual DNA. Um, could somebody go into John 8 and um, I want to get down to 44, but I think it, the idea starts up a little bit. The counter side to this is the mystery of iniquity or that natural um, mind that's not of the um, nature of Yahshua and um, also has genetic traits, so to speak, in the spirit. And I just it, it just struck me that we have a family name. And um, if somebody, if you're walking down the street in a group of people and somebody yells from the street corner, hey, Yahshua, um, we're going to turn around. We're going to recognize mm -hmm. that name. We're going to know that that's part of um, our family. And that's not a normal situation, obviously. Nobody, very few people know the name of Yahshua and would have it um, in that scenario. But you would react if you heard that name, Yahshua or Yahweh. Mm -hmm. out there in conversation your ears perk up you're thinking oh they're talking about my family or they're talking about me i need to hear what's going on here um all right so let's see this is joshua speaking red letter again um let's see let's um well let's just do 44 um let's see well i'm gonna just pick it up a little bit here I take that back. We're going to start a little bit before 44. Um, all right. Wow. Um, 38. 38. Okay, start at 38. John 8, 38. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. All right, now he's, Yashua's speaking to um, the religious elders of the day and groups of people around him, um, they're going back and forth like they always did, trying to prod him and um, annoy him and poke him to say things that they can then use. Um, uh, they love to do the word of Yahweh deceitfully, as we had read in that other verse. Go ahead. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Yahshua saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of Yahweh. This did not Abraham. All right. And so he obviously is not 
Um, he doesn't really care what they think. He's not trying to soft pedal a response or be diplomatic. He's just telling them the way that it is. And he's saying, you're seeking to kill me because I'm telling you the truth. And then Abraham would not have done this. Go ahead. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even Yahweh. Yahshua saith unto them, if Yahweh were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from Yahweh. Neither came I of myself, but he that sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father will you do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. All right. So he's pointing out to them what their genetic material is, mm -hmm. what their spiritual DNA is. And um, he and this is what we um, are trying to discern and avoid being deceived by out in the world. Another one of our aims um, because not everybody has the love of the truth as part of their DNA. And when they don't, there's all sorts of ways that that can manifest, um, from deceit and, um, all the things that the carnal mind is capable of. And, um, we, we, and we just find joyful um, the fact that when someone does understand the truth and that light illuminates them from within and the Holy Spirit has, it just inspires them and causes great joy and happiness and, and excitement about coming to the school, about learning, um, about being a minister under this covenant. Um, it, it's just an incredible thing. And I hope that, um, some of the things that I've said help um, or cause us to look at some things in a little bit different light. Um, I'm always, I love things that are what I would label thought provoking because I think it's a very healthy thing that, thank you, I see that, that something provokes or stimulates our thinking to look at some things in a different way, to ask questions. Questions are a blessing. And so never shy away from having questions um, or asking somebody for more information or helping you to um, research and, and to prove out something. All those things are the, um, the joy and um, righteousness, peace and joy, Romans 14, 17 um, from the kingdom. And so enjoy coming to school, enjoy being a student and a teacher. And um, we'll continually thank Yahweh for our blessings and for the inspiration that he gives us. And I will turn this back over to the moderator. Thank you. Sorry, I had a trouble getting unmuted there. Thank you very much, Dr. Susan Sikowski. That concludes today's class. So we'll end with the doxology. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yashem, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let the class say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.